Lord, we can be forgetful people. We need to remember your grace, your mercy, your favor. We need to remember to put on the helmet of salvation. So, Lord, as we look at your word, may we receive your word as good soil in our hearts. And would you grow us more into the image and nature of your very Son. Grow us more into Christ. Help us to be built into Christ because he is our only hope. So, Lord, as we open your word, open our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can stand with me, we're going to read from, I'm going to read from Ephesians 6. Um, Just stand for the reading of the word as we, um, as you listen and follow along. If you have your Bible or your phone app, pull up Ephesians 6. I'll start in verse 10 and just read the section. We are going to be camping out in the first part of verse 17 um, today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Therefore, oh, excuse me, over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace and in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying in all times in the Spirit, whether with all prayer, with all prayer and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. May God bless the reading of your wor- his word as you find your seats again. We are going to be talking about the hope of salvation, the helmet of the hope of salvation. You know, few, well, it's been several years since the movie Saving Private Ryan came out, but the opening scene kind of gets left in your remembrance as you see these men giving their lives to take that beachhead in Normandy back in World War II. But there's one aspect of the scene that is kind of striking. It's this one soldier, he gets hit in his helmet, and it just dents the helmet. Well, he takes off the helmet to look at, and he's amazed he's, he's still alive, and then the bullet hits him. And, and it's, it's a reminder that we need the helmet of salvation. It's not for us to decide salvation. It's for God himself who saves us. Salvation belongs to God. And it's, often, it's not often that you walk out of the house without your shoes, especially if you're going to the store or you're going a long distance. Because the first time you step on gravel or step on something, you will soon find out you need your shoes. Other things get left behind or lost, or more easily lost, like an umbrella. So think of how many times, maybe I'm alone, but how many times you might have left an umbrella somewhere. You took it out, you were going to have it for when it rained, and you left it leaning against 
the seat in the bus or somewhere, and you're like, where'd that umbrella go? You see, you leave an umbrella in areas because you don't realize that the rain is going to pour or you, you forget about it. Clearly, the helmet of salvation is something that we can easily misplace or forget until crisis hits and bullets start flying. When life gets hard, you quickly find out that your headgear needs to be made of something that lasts, not something that's flimsy like a sun hat that's floppy, right? That's, that's not going to last in a battle. It's good for keeping the sun out of your eyes, but what you need is a helmet. That sun hat won't divert a sword from, from hitting your skull, but a helmet will. And so that's why Paul says that we live in a world where hope seems to be lost, where there isn't much... Um, use for theology. A lot of people think theology is a throwaway thing. Spiritual warfare of all the bad news, the darkness, the despair, the suffering, you don't have to go far to see that the hope of salvation is something that we need today. It's not something that we can do without. Depression's on the rise. Suicide's on the rise. All these things need to be informed with the hope that only God can bring in his word. So the main idea today, we're going to be talking about the hope of salvation is received by faith, renews your confidence, and rescues God's people. So there's going to be three aspects we cover. And the first one is the hope of salvation is received by faith. The word here is a little bit different from the other words where he says to put on or take on. This one actually means to be given or receive something. It it, it means to take it as your own from God as he gives it to you. Paul uses this word in other letters sometimes of receiving a person, receiving a spiritual gift, welcoming a person. So, So you get the idea that when we take on the helmet of salvation, we're receiving something that God alone has but he's given to you. So the helmet of salvation is connected to the breastplate of righteousness in Isaiah 59, 17. It's borrowed from the image of the divine Messiah warrior that puts on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. So if you've come in here thinking that you have your own righteousness that's going to make you acceptable to God, let me kind of blow that away and say, there's no righteousness you can do that can make you acceptable to God. You need the righteousness of Christ applied to your life. Because what ends up happening, if we understand our own sinfulness in light of God's word, and that's what all through Isaiah is talking about how God's people had failed. And so God brings certain victory not through them believing in themselves, just pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. Instead, God brings victory through his, himself, through coming as Christ, through coming as the Messiah, the warrior, king. He comes and he brings salvation. And they have, we have to understand there's a cause and effect of what God does in righteousness and salvation, and they are connected together. We cannot have salvation apart from God's righteousness. His commitment to fulfill his promises is not a question mark. It's an explanation. It's completely done through what Christ has done. This means that he will act to deliver his people from their enemies. That their enemies are not just physical, such as the Assyrians and the Babylonians, but there's greater enemies out there. The greatest enemy of all is sin, because what does it do? It separates us from God himself. So, listen to how Isaiah describes his righteousness and his salvation. Isaiah 51 is what I'm going to read from here. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out. My arms will judge the people. The coastlands hope in me, for my arm... They will wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look, to the, look at all the earth, for the heavens vanish like a smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. 
They who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation, my salvation will be forever. My righteousness will never be dismayed. So listen to me. You who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. In other words, God's putting his law on his people through salvation. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat up all the garments, the worms will eat them up like wool, but my righteousness, it will be forever. And my salvation to all the generations. That's the good news that the gospel is not going to fail. It's going to go out in power, in purpose, and at the end of all things, when we stand before the throne, it's Christ's righteousness that we stand in. God's righteousness assures his people that his salvation will be ultimate and it will be sure. It's not going to be flimsy and a maybe. It's a sure salvation. Even though the trials of Babylon for those in Isaiah's time were real, the exile was extremely difficult. Had God abandoned his people? No, he hadn't. He was still working in the midst of all the trials and judgment that he brought on them because of their sin. God's people should be encouraged by the confident hope that we have, not in ourselves, but in Christ himself. God's promises will never fail. Think of Rome. Rome seemed insurmountably eternal when they lived in that empire, but in the end, it crumbled and fell away. Rome failed. People in time and places come and go. Empires rise and they fall. The earth will wear out one day, Isaiah says, like an old garment. What we see that seems so eternal today or so solid today will one day dissolve up in smoke. Look at Ephesus today. If you, if you were to look up Ephesus on the internet, it's just ruined. It needs to be excavated to see all that's in there, but there's, it's just ruins. But at one point, that was one of the largest cities in the world. And so Psalm 46, which um, a mighty fortress is, is actually written after, it's that Psalm 46, he says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. They, he utters his voice and the earth itself melts. The Lord of hosts, he is with us. The God of Jacob He is our fortress. Selah. There is no better hope than God himself. There is no stronger hope than God himself. God's righteous character guarantees that our confident hope will not be misplaced if it's in him. He will fulfill all that he has promised. He will deliver and restore all of his people. Those whom he's called to trust in him from before the foundations of the world, God will gloriously love and save, and it will never fail. He will never fail. Listen to Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us, in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him because in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. If you are in Christ today, your hope is sure. Your salvation is not in question. But he has hold, he's holding you. He has firmly promised that he will secure, he will provide that hope in the midst of trials. No matter the difficulties of life, God will not let you go. He will never give up. He will never say, oh, this is too much. I'm just going to let this person go. Instead, he holds us in his hand. And nothing that happens is outside of his will. So the Christian hope is not some blind leap into an abyss, but it's a hope of faith that's surely found on the hope of Christ himself. 
So we trust our God. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Paul says, But since we belong to the day, let us soberly, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and of love for, and for our helmet, the hope of salvation. So that's why I'm saying like, this is not just salvation in general, but this is your hope pointed to what Christ is doing in and through the gospel. Our hope is, is not something that we put in ourselves. Think about this. Why are we saved? We are all, in reality, sinful. To To the core of our being, if we were honest, our hearts are deceptively wicked, full of sin. And in fact, we think in our sinful nature that we're good enough that God should just Save us because he's a nice guy. But the reality is that we're so sinful, we're self-deceived, and we actually deserve hell. But because of Christ, he interrupted us. He drew us to himself. He saved us at the cross. He said, turn from sin to salvation. And that's what we do. We repent, and we realize that when we come to Christ, Hope is not some vague optimism that everything is just going to work out somehow. Hope is in, in the Bible, hope is something that's settled, that's sure, that it's something that you can kind of sink your teeth into, knowing that biblical hope is founded in a God who promises and fulfills everything that he promises. It's not like one day you're going to go to the bank of faith to God's bank, and say, okay, I, wanna, I need some funds for today. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm all, I'm all out. There's nothing left. His resources are unlimited and completely, completely at work for all of his children. Listen to what Peter says, 1 Peter 3. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. So have no fear of them talking about the rest of the world that was against them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord and as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for the reason that you have and the hope that's in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when they slander you, Those who revile your good behavior in Christ will actually be put to shame. So what he's saying is that this is not a Hail Mary toss-up that I hope that I'm going to be saved, that the world is is a, a bad place, but the reality is that Christ has gone into the world himself. He's written himself into our world. And if we die tonight, and God were to ask you, you know, you... You, I, maybe some of you have done evangelism explosion, but you'd always ask the person, if we died tonight and God asked you why you should let, he should let you into heaven, what would your answer be? See, this is a great diagnostic question to think about because a lot of people today, if you ask someone that, they would say, maybe, I'm a good person. I'm better than most people. I've done some, the best I can do. I've tried to obey the Ten Commandments, to love God, maybe love others. But some believe that they are better or no worse than anyone else. And these have a very uncertain hope because there's always the question of, are you going to be good enough to measure up at the end? How good is God's standard? And how good is your heart? If you were to put all the thoughts you've had in the last month up on a screen... Would you be proud? Or would you say, hmm, my heart is more deceptive than I thought. My heart is more sinful than I thought. See, when we compare our own hearts to God's high standard of righteousness, just in a single day, we don't get it even stand a chance. Our hearts are so self-deceived, we would never measure up to God's holy standard. We can be sure where we stand only if we look to his word. 
What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in yourself? Or are you trusting in Christ? Are you turning from sin? Or are you hoping in sin? See, listen, listen to John's reason for faith in, um, in God's salvation and rescue. 1 John 5, 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. How do we know for certain of our destiny? It can't be based on our goodness because our best days, are, we may think we're better than we are. Our worst days, we may think, huh, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. So think of on a given week, maybe someone would have a great day and they, oh, I, got, I, I had time to go and into the Word, I had time to pray. But then other days, it's so busy and, and distorted that you don't have time and, and you're, you're frustrated, you're going through your day. The reality is it's not based on how you feel. It's based on the good news that Christ has already redeemed you at the cross. Listen to, again to 1 John, right before he wrote in verse 13, he wrote 11 and 12. He said, and this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life. And this life, is it in our experience? Is it in our emotions? No, it's in his son. Whoever has the son, does he say might have life? No, he says he has life. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So we receive eternal life through the Son himself. If you trust yourself, then you've turned away from the Son. There's no way you can go to heaven trusting yourself. You must trust in Christ alone. You can be sure of heaven, though, if you've trusted Christ. It's not dependent on your efforts. It's the free gift that Christ gives to those who come to him in faith. If you've received Christ's perfect righteousness, his goodness, and asked for all your sinful rottenness to be put placed on Christ, he promises that he will dress you in the breastplate of righteousness. And he will give you the helmet of salvation. Freely. He has paid for it. He has delivered it to you as a gift. God's righteousness and firm foundation of salvation belong hand-in-hand together, and it provides our confident hope. So, second point, the hope of God's salvation renews your confidence. It renews your confidence. See, confident assurance in Christ would be arrogant if it was based on what you did. If it was based on earning salvation yourself, you'd say, well, yeah, I'm saved. Look at all that I did. That would be arrogant. That would be something that the Bible says would actually be sinful. But it's not pride of, look at how good we are. In fact, you you go back to the beginning of Ephesians, and at the end here, he's summing up the gospel for us to remember to put it on. We were alienated, without Christ, without hope in this world. But what did he do? God opened our hearts to Christ. He gave us faith. He gave us repentance, so we know that he is our only hope. In fact, the Holy Spirit has called us to hope together in Christ, in his church. So after all is said and done, is there anything that can take the salvation that God himself has given to you away? What can separate us from the love of God? I think of when I was younger, I I would ride my bike around the neighborhood, and every once in a while you come across kids that were not so kind, we call them bullies, right? And they they would push you off the bike or something like that, want to take your bike. What if you had your dad with you, though? While you're riding your bike around, you have this new mountain bike, and your dad comes along, and not only is your dad your dad, but what if he were an Olympic martial artist? 300 pounds of pure muscle. So who would bother you then? The reality is we have a God that's much bigger and stronger than that. No one 
not hell itself can take us out of the hands of our mighty God. Christ wore the armor first. He has donned the breastplate of righteousness. He has put on the helmet of salvation. And he's already gone to war. Jesus lived the perfect spotless life. He was our righteousness. And when we apply his life to ours, our hope is in Christ. And it will not be put ashamed. The reality is that he's already obeyed. Hebrews 5 says they've tested. We don't have to be anxious. He's already obeyed fully and completely. He did it for the joy that was set before him. He didn't despise the cross. He didn't get coaxed into going to the cross. He did it because he knew it was the only way we would be saved. And he has become our eternal salvation for all who trust and believe and even obey him. See, Christ wore the crown of thorns and is now crowned in glory beyond our wildest dreams. He has accomplished the perfect righteousness through his perfect life. Our salvation has already been accomplished through the person and work of Christ. So we get protection from the sword blows of the enemy, from the projectiles that flow through the air towards us, as our helmet of salvation practically does what it's designed to do. We are protected from difficulty and distress, and it defends the Christian from discouragement and despair, knowing that this life is not the last mile, that, not the only thing. You shouldn't be discouraged from current circumstances, knowing that one day we will stand in a glory that we can't even begin to describe. It's beyond our wildest imagination. Think of like, like a man on his way he gets a notice that he, he has $10 billion of inheritance from a great aunt that he didn't know anything about. But while he's on his way, his car breaks down, he gets a parking ticket, everything goes wrong that can go wrong. If you knew at the last end that you had this inheritance already guaranteed coming to you, all these minor inconveniences would be seen as just a minor inconvenience. Ephesians 1 says, in him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. So Paul is actually saying this exact thing, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first, we first hope in Christ. And it, so the reality is that we're, our hope, our salvation, past, present, and future, so when we think of salvation, we don't think of it as just this, amorphous thing, the reality is that Christ in the past died on the cross. We didn't make that up. It's historical, it's reality, and he rose again. That's why we celebrate Easter every year. That's why we really celebrate Easter every Sunday we meet, if you think about it. Because the old law, the old covenant, said we meet on Saturday. The new covenant, we meet on Sunday, because that's when Christ rose from the dead. So past, present, and future, we've been justified, we are being sanctified, and we will be glorified. That's the reality of our hope in the gospel, our hope in the salvation. So often our present afflictions take the focus of our everlasting hope. So think, think, think along with me, 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are just transient. They're passing away. They're flimsy. They're see-through almost. But the things that are unseen are eternal. They're solid. They're going to last forever. This side of eternity, often the trials feel soul-crushing and at times seem impossible to bear. In light of certain hope in the salvation, these burdens actually don't compare to the weight of glory that's just around the corner. He calls, he calls it light and momentary compared to the weight of eternal things coming. We know that God is up to something good even when our lives have affliction, even when we struggle and we fail. He's producing 
perseverance and character. And God tells us to count everything joy. Listen to James. James says in, in chapter 1, count it all joy. Does he say just most things joy, some things joy? No, all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials of all kinds, various kinds. For we know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, the purpose of trials is not just because God says, oh, well, I think I'll throw some trials into their life today. No, he has exact purposes for everything that we face. Trials are discouraging. They weigh us down. We need brothers and sisters in the midst of our trials. We need God's spirit and his word. And we need the common grace of prayer and trusting him. We need to trust him more than we trust our own sight, if you think about it. Often, we're caught in a discouraging cycle of sinful responses when we see what's happening. It almost seems like a failure, failure merry-go-round at times. Or, a, you know, you get trial merry-go-round. We get discouraged. But when we see our hope in Christ, it brings courage and strength. Paul says in, in Philippians, he said, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So point three, the hope of God's salvation rescues his people. He's not done yet. The hope of God's salvation rescues his people. So doubt about your eternal salvation will lead you on a trajectory into despair. If you look at the waves around rather than Christ, you must remind yourself what God desires to do, and he's laid it out in his word. God's salvation hope supports you in the deepest afflictions that you can find. Hope protects you when you're sick or sad. Hope sustains you when you feel rejected and lonely. Hope bears you up when you're depressed or downcast. Hope even strengthens you when, you're fair, when you are staring down face to face with the last enemy, death. Death shall not have the final victory. Christ, in whom our hope rests, has already triumphed over death. He's risen from the dead. He's ascended to glory. Jesus has already defeated death and purchased your salvation to heaven through his death, burial, and resurrection. So why do you think that he would be less triumphant over lesser trials? If death could not separate you, then what can? Romans 8, right? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, angels, nor rulers, present things, things to come, powers, height nor depth. Anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love which is in God, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our hope in Christ, in his salvation, protects us in the deepest valleys we find. The hope reminds us to hold things in this world more light and those things in the next with eternal hope. Remember that every life has highs and lows. This, this life that we live, weighed in comparison with God's glory, doesn't compare. Our hearts need to be shaped by our love for Christ. We need to be reconformed to what he loves in the fact that he is the one who loves us. Augustine, who lived long time ago, writes, he loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee, which he loves not for thy sake. In other words, where is your love focused at? And what is your love hoping in it? If it's in Christ, it will not fail. Hope and salvation protects us even in the darkest valley. It remembers to put on the helmet of salvation and that God's power and his care will never give up. 
Salvation hope gives you the boldness in faithfully pursuing God's call on your life. You don't have to fear what's around the corner. He takes the ordinary and supernaturally gives you grace to risk many things for his plan. He's the one who created us. He sustains us. He saves us. So faithfully, we trust his word, his spirit, to bring fruit that we can't see today. But he's still working. Faithfully, we trust the the reality that our God, our sovereign, faithful God, is over the challenges and dangers that we see. That even though it seems impossible, one day, he will truly bring us home safe. God often calls us to to serve faithfully, knowing that our hope is in him, not in our circumstances. It's not in the things around us. God's love for us was planned before we ever spoke anything. We get salvation from sin, but he, from him, we get salvation, not just in an idea, but he gives us himself. We get God himself for our salvation. That's what the helmet of salvation really is pointed to, is Christ himself. We live for his glory, not our own. And so when we put Christ on, we want others to see Christ in us. He is the hope of glory. Many who have followed God in the mission field or in the face of tribulation may seem things have failed all around them. They may seem, you read Elizabeth Elliot's story, and she lost her husband. She, she struggled on the mission field. And we, she felt like a failure in so many different ways. But the reality is that God was working in the midst of that failure. God was destroying idols. He was building her on a, the stability of his own salvation, realizing that our families, our parenting, our careers, all these things must be seen in light of who God is, that he is working, he is active, that he is saving to the uttermost. The Lord promises to work all things according to his glory. He promises to work in and for and using us for his glory. Our labor in Christ will never be in vain if we look to him, trusting him, knowing that he sustains us in his grace. Hope encourages us not not to continue in sin, but to resist sin to stand against sin and fight because he has given us the victory, trusting that his power and provision in the moment, day to day, will continue. Romans 6, 14 says, For sin will not have dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but you're under grace. What an amazing thing to think about the grace of God. In other words, the fight with sin may often feel like Groundhog Day struggling with the same thing over and over again. And in this life, it seems like it's constantly a source of discouragement. But our sin and brokenness is the way that God is showing your utter inability to change or save yourself. This is why we need the gospel. The good news needs to affect every part of your life. We can do nothing apart from him. Because he walked out of the tomb, one day we we too will rise. That's the reality. God has promised that he will be present with us, perfect in Christ. One day, we will see him face to face. See, hope gives us a holy patience to endure in the midst of struggle, that we're not done with sin. It's not over yet. The power of sin has been broken, but the presence of sin is still remaining. So Romans 7 says, wretched man that I am, Who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. In other words, Paul's saying I'm still in the battle. The hope of the helmet of salvation means that that not just that we get out of hell as an out of hell free card, but we realize that our disordered loves often litter our lives. In other words, we love things that we love in a, not in a, accordance with what God has done. So it may be money, comfort. We may value these other things above who God is. And God is constantly weeding the garden of our lives, so to speak. 
pulling those things out and saying, look at me. I'm the best thing there is. Stop looking to these lesser things. We need to know that here and now that our hope is not in ourselves, not in what we do, not in the things we own. Our hope is in Christ himself. So, he doesn't right away get rid of our weaknesses and sins, our lack of love for others, our half-heartedness, but he's working on that. And one day soon, this hope of salvation is what motivates us to press on in the fight, striving hard to follow the Savior, to trust in his provision, to put on the helmet of salvation, putting aside the things that hold you back, pressing on for, to trust Christ more and more. In Christ, you are justified. You're sanctified. One day, you're going to be glorified. Remember those three tenses of salvation. He, it's not over yet. We need to remember and think about the glories that Christ is doing right now, today. If you had a, that inheritance that I talked about before, and suddenly you get a parking ticket, but you're more focused on the parking ticket than the innumerable riches that are coming to you, you're going to have despair. But if you remember that God has already done what only he could do, it drives you out of that tailspin of despair back to hope. When people get married, when, when there's a wedding, often brides spend hours visualizing and planning the ideal wedding. They get magazines. Wait, do they have magazines still today? I don't know if they have magazines. There's websites and all sorts of things that you're looking through and saying, oh, this would be the, the best wedding ever. Well, we need to realize that that imagination is what we need to think about when we come to the gospel and, and the life to come. Really, there's never been, if you think of a wedding, have you ever seen an ugly bride? There's no such thing. They look flawless on you know, they, they, they look beautiful. All brides are beautiful, I'm not saying. My bride's the best, but no. <laughs> but the reality is that, you know, the idea of the wedding and, and, and Christ died for his bride. When we come to communion table, we partake as a family. So next week, we're, we're going to take communion together. The, his body was broken. His blood was shed. And he has applied that new covenant reality to our lives. Th think of the fact that, that when we see Christ, we will see him because he's made us perfect, spotless, blameless in himself. He's washed us clean. He's given us the, the righteous robe to put on. You see, think of the fact that Christ has forgiven you so much and even reigns in heaven, and one day every knee will bow. So we don't go through each day without this reminder. We need to remember the helmet of salvation. It gives you boldness to experience the joy in Christ, even in the midst of troubles and trials within this world. Think, think of what... C.S. Lewis has a great imagination. I think sometimes I need his help to think, think beyond what we see. Um, in, in The Weight of Glory, which is a famous sermon he, he gave, he says, at the present, we are on the outside of the world, the true world. In other words, he's saying this world isn't the true world. This is just an echo. This is, this is less than what we will see. He said, we're on the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of the morning, but they, they do not make us fresh and pure. We, we cannot mingle with the splendors we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament, they're wrestling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. And it's because of Christ that we get in. Think, in closing, I'm going to just read this. Charles Wesley, I believe, was a, was a closet reformed Calvinist even though his brother wasn't. <laughs> but listen to the words that he wrote on his bigness and, and his, his big view of God. He says, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and it all in him is mine. 
alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. So bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Let's pray. Lord, we do boldly approach the eternal throne. We claim the crown that you, Christ, have given us, the helmet of salvation that you have provided for us, the reality that we cannot do anything apart from the work that you've done. May, us, may we remind ourselves each day that we need to put on that helmet. We need to trust the gospel more than we trust ourselves, knowing that you alone have paid it all. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord. Continue to help us to grow in this grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to the power working within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen.